everybody and uh, you're very welcome today on what is a glorious summer's day here in the city. It's great to, to see a, a sense of optimism around the capital and of course around the country in the last few days given the recent government um, announcements and ease on restrictions. Um, without further ado, again I'd like to welcome you all today uh, to the second installment of our On The Spot series. Um, a leadership series uh, whereby our host, Gareth Hart, will be um, interviewing guests, um, thought leaders in various different industries. Um, and just to, just to say thanks to, to Ted Webb and Richard, Richard Chambers from our, our first series. I know it was a, um, a resounding success given the feedback. And um, even more so today to, to extend a delighted welcome to, to Ronan Webster. Ronan is Head of Asset Management for Hen Henderson Park, formerly of uh, Greenreit and CBRE. So as I mentioned, Gareth Hart is our host again today. Um, Gareth, we're looking forward to you navigating the conversation today with Ronan and uh, for Killian to be joining on a Q&A. I'll hand over the reins to you, Gareth. Thanks, David, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Garrett Hartz, my name is David said, and I'll be facilitating this, the second on the spot leadership and business webinar hosted by Spot Recruitment. So if the term property expert was ever more appropriate than it is for our guest this afternoon, Ronan Webster. Ronan is head of asset management at Henderson Park Advisors, joining that company in June of last year after a decade with Green Reit as Director of Asset Management and Henderson Park's acquisition of Green Reit for reported 1.34 billion euro. Uh, and we'll get to talk about that in a little bit more detail later. An honours graduate of Trinity College, Ronan has been at the coalface of the property sector in Ireland for over three decades. And uh, safe to say, what a roller coaster ride that has been. Uh, Ronan also spent two years in California in 1996, which he says has had a significant influence on his professional career and, and outlook. A born and bred dub, Ronan is steeped in sport. And while his early years was all about kicking points over the bar, it was the lure of association football and soccer and the 11 side game that took center stage. Ronan, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Gareth. Good afternoon. Great to join you. And thanks, David and Killian, for asking me. Um, looking forward to giving what little insights I can today. I just pick up on one thing, Gareth. I, uh, I graduated from DIT, so I'd like to give a shout out for TUD. And what we used to do before TUD was university, you used to get your, uh, your degree from Trinity, even though so everyone kind of I, likes to brandish the, TD, uh, the Trinity College degree around which I got, but I'd, I've, uh, I'm a big fan of TUD and DIT, so I want Good. to just put that, put that on the record. It's a great, great college. It's now all up and nearly all moved to Grange Gorman, although Bolton Street, I think, is the last one where I went. It's, it's going to be the last one to move up there. No problem. Listen, I know you're an Arsenal fan, so I presume you had a, a wry smile on your face last night with your former boss out winning Man United. I was saying, I was saying to guys this morning, I put a tenor on um, Villarreal to beat Man United 3-1 to one last night just for the crack so I could have an interest, yeah. Uh, I'm an Arsenal fan for my sins. I played football with St. Moctus here locally where I grew up and home farm. Uh, but I always kind of liked the, I think it was probably back to showing my age, the, the Brady, uh, O'Leary and Stapleton days that got me interested in Arsenal and a famous cup final in 1979. And I like Arsenal, the way they play football, but it, Probably a little bit frustrating at the moment. I'm probably waning away from football. I kind of gone back more to more interest in GEA because of the amateur ethos. I think the money, it's become a big business. You might as well be following Amazon as following a, yeah. a football club these days. So I've fallen back in love with GEA uh, over the last 10 years and Dublin football to the, uh, I do have a, a fond eye. I keep an eye on Mayo because of Killian, but, um, you know, really love what the, GA is about, and I think it's going to replace religion in, in Ireland as the, the, the fulcrum of community. Even, uh, I know probably country people feel that that's very much 
center stage in their in their villages and their towns. But I think uh, unless you live when you live in Dublin, you realize how much it is really important in Dublin as well. The GEA a suburb doesn't really have a center in Dublin, uh, but now the GEA I think uh, has become the the center of of everything we are about in Dublin, and particularly even with the growth of uh, I have three girls who all played GEA. So I think even the growth of women's sport in the GEA has been a great thing over the last yeah. five or 10 years. So with 45 minutes uh, uh, of, of your time and, and the, the audience's time uh, this afternoon, and we're going to try and do a, a uh, speedy run around a few key topics. Ronan, want to begin with your your early life, your, your career to date, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the property sector and, and certainly it has been the dominant uh, story for a number of weeks. Uh, look a little bit then forward into uh, the future and how you view the next couple of years as we uh, come out of the pandemic. And then some insights into your own management style and resilience, which uh, we talked about and which will bring Killian in towards the end. So so let's go back to the beginning, Ronan. And when we spoke a few days ago, what really struck me was the number of times you referenced your parents uh, in, in, in how they had an influence on your work ethic, that entrepreneurial spirit and, and that fearless approach to life. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, I didn't realize that, but I'm, I'm kind of glad. It's lovely to hear you say that, that that came through. Uh, because, yeah, I'd be very proud of both my parents are still alive, although in their late 80s. Uh, my dad, uh, mum and dad are from Connemara. Uh, so always great sport in our house uh, when Galway or Mayo are playing against the Dubs. And uh, I think th- my parents are... 60 years living in Dublin, I think probably it took until about 2011 for both of them to even dare put a smile on when they saw Dublin win in All-Ireland. But yeah, they both came up to Dublin from uh, Connemara. Mum is uh, Mayo, Galway border, dad, uh, native Gwelgor. So I think it was very important for them was building a network in Dublin for young, a young couple with young kids in Dublin. So they were all about networking. So when we were all growing up, they were always touching in and Anybody that was from Mayo or Galway, we were always brought off to meet them. Or They were very good at welcoming other young people that moved up to Dublin as well. And I really, really love that. And I think probably that's one thing that uh, maybe Dublin people take for granted. They have a network automatically when they go to school or go to college here. Uh, I probably missed not be living in college. I, I kind of love my kids to go away to college out of Dublin because you get the real college experience. Uh, but it really took from them hard work. Uh, they always felt that they've something to prove coming from the West um, against, you know, other people at work who are from Dublin. So that was one thing. Long hours were never a problem. Um, you know, uh, there was always a, we always used to slag even between my parents north of Mam Cross. People used to speak English south of Mam Cross. Uh, they, they were Gwelgors. My dad, I always asked my dad was young. Well, why is that? And he says, oh, well, they took the soup north of Mam Cross. They were weak. So you used to have to lower Joss Berle just to get your food, whereas they were tough. They, they, they'd rather die than speak Joss Berle. So there was always a bit of fun about that, that, you know, you were tough uh, from the West and you came up and you proved yourself and you worked hard. And if you weren't doing something, my dad could never sit down. Like even if he'd time off, he was on holidays, he'd have to be doing something. So I probably got that ingrained in me that, you know, just get, get busy living uh, rather than busy talking about it. That was... Yeah certainly yeah. something that came through from uh, the West of Ireland people. And just picking up on that point around networking and look, we're, we're, we're all acutely aware of, of uh, the inability to fully network uh, over, over the past 14 months and, and the value of networking. And, and uh, we'll talk later about um, what you see uh, the future holding in terms of work practice, but you, you, you mentioned to me before as well about the, the fact that the the office is far from dead and, and the need for that creative community and the network in community. How, how important is that to you in terms of, of work ethic? Well, I, I think it's, it's interesting. KPMG uh, Worldwide did a survey of the top 500 global CEOs last August. 
And what came through that survey was they felt, oh, the future of work is going to be split between home and office. They also felt that they, you know, they felt the home working was going to be a real part of their business. And they felt that they would all be shrinking the amount of space to be taken. That was last August. It completely flipped on its head. I think there was a real kind of novelty about people working from home. Yes, we were dealing with a pandemic. People had a, had a time to draw breath. I think people who, had, who were parents, for instance, didn't have to run around to five different sporting occasions a weekend. They didn't have to be busy meeting people that they didn't want to meet. So I think people actually got a time to breathe and have a look around at how they worked and how they lived. So it was a bit of a novelty. As winter wore on and we've come into this year, I think people have seen the productivity levels have dropped. Clearly they've dropped. And it's fine for an old man like me who's 30 years in the business. You, you and me, Gareth, can kind of self-start in the morning. We, we've built the tools over 25, 30 years in business to know what to do and how to self-start during the day. But I know when I was a young guy working in the office, you need somebody to guide you. You need to sit beside somebody, see how they react to a negative or an adversary, adversarial meeting. Uh, so if you want to build uh, a team, if you want to teach, if you want to learn, you can only do that when you're in the physical presence of your colleagues. I, I, I've learned all of uh, everything that I know and everything I do I, and I still do today. I learn from other people. I learn, I learn from younger people. So I don't have that osmosis. You can't, like 75% uh, of what you pick up is just by doing. It's not by being on a call like this. You can pick up little bits, but it's only when you're in the presence of other people and you see the body language, you see how people deal with situations, how people diffuse tension. That's all, you'll only learn that by seeing how people use humor. Um, so you know, even Google would tell you they're a new tenant of ours. Um, they can't wait to get all their people back in the office. Could you imagine if you're a young person joining Google today or you joined Google in March last year and you haven't sat in the office, you haven't had your manager or your leader physically with you to show you the ropes. And it's the old phrase, show you the ropes. It's like an office and a factory floor or a farm. They're all the same thing. How do you learn? You you watch somebody else doing it and doing it properly. Yeah. You can kind of you can read a textbook of how it might be done, but until you're sitting beside the expert who does it and does it properly, and you know, wow, that's how it's actually done. You could watch a same with sports. You could watch a video of somebody teaching you how to pick up a game of football, or you know, or to hit a tennis racket. Until you actually see it live for yourself, you don't really know or haven't experienced it. So, the office, I actually think it'll be the. I think it's really brought home to roost that the future of business is in the office. And people collaborating and working together because of the productivity that's been lost. There'll be, and I just watched though, uh, some companies are going to use this as an opportunity to for efficiencies and to downsize, and they'll they'll blame it on a, a you know we don't need to be in the office. But I think successful companies w that are growing, you'll see that they you know people need to be together working together. I I, I think there'll be definitely more sense of and i know myself that there'll be days it suits me let's say there's something on at home to be wednesday afternoon working from home or it suits me i think i, I will bet most people if they're given a day that they right one day work from home everybody will go for friday because that's the day they want to be at home but it will be a mix where there's a lady in our office who has young kids she used to be in the office at 7 a.m leave the home at six on a bus from beaumont and uh, just so she could be back to her kids and she doesn't need to be in the office every day. She can work in the morning, 7, 8, 8 a.m. till about 11, come in for a few hours, then go home. So you'll build a hybrid out of things. Yeah. So let's get into your, your, your own career. And as I said, the, the guts of 30 years uh, in the property sector. Um, where, did the, where did the interest originate from and, and the motivation for getting into that when you were looking at college options and, and uh, deciding on what you wanted to study? Um, I probably, I don't know if there's a, you probably remember this, Gareth, there was the old thing and when people had no money, you do the Sunday drive. I don't remember the Sunday drive. You throw all the kids in the car and go off and drive around Dublin. I don't know, we used to drive, we used to play Monopoly at home and I remember my dad driving us up Shrewsbury Road. Remember, that's the most expensive one on Monopoly board. And he started asking questions, why is that? And that's because everyone wants to live there and look at the houses. So I kind of got interested in buildings at a very young age. 
I kind of wanted to be an architect, but I was useless at drawings. There's not an artistic bone in my body. So um, my technical drawing teacher actually said, why don't you go into uh, this, these uh, seminars they do when we're in sixth year before the CAO, go into DIT, go into Bolton Street. And we all went off and actually was very intrigued by the, it was called environmental economics lecture at the time, and property economics. And it was a guy, uh, John Mulcahy, who ended up the head of NAMA, he was the head of Jones Lang, actually spoke that night. And I've kind of made it my duty and I've said it to other kind of leaders in our industry to go to those talks to kind of, so you can see that we all saw him pulling up outside in a fancy car and a nice suit. And he actually had a mobile phone at the time. It was a brick. We were blown away. Oh my God, this is an amazing world. So that kind of wowed me. Uh, I put it on the CAO and I think it was called environmental economics. So I think for the first three years, my mother thought I was going off to save the whale or, uh, you know, environmental, uh, was going to, you know, save the world. And, uh, but yeah, I still explained to her that it was, it was the kind of the commercial end of auctioneering. So this auctioneering valuation was one side of it, was the diploma side and the degree side was all probably leaning towards commercial property because it was more about tax and funding structures, the world I'm in now, where it's, it's a world that's not really known in Ireland. So if you look at all the big funds, uh, I, I put Irish Life, Heinz, uh, Hibernia Reese, Green Reese, that's basically all populated. The boards of those companies are populated with, with people who've been through property economics. Charter, your, your ultimate qualification is to become a chartered surveyor, and it's focusing on the more uh, technical side of real estate rather than just selling houses. But I still, at the end of the day, if I start off telling people what you do, and I kind of try and I give up because they just tell me, all right, you, so you sell houses. I just go, yeah, I sell, I sell houses. So, um... Sherry Fitz uh, was one of the, the first uh, companies that you work with. And, and again, Mark Fitzgerald is someone that you, you read highly as a, a huge influence and mentor in your early days. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark is a great, great guy, still a great friend. And uh, Mark recognized early, Mark was a true innovator in, in property, in real estate, not just in Ireland, but recognized in UK and Ireland and Europe. In fact, they set up one of the biggest uh, real estate companies that they sold in London, uh, Marsh and Parsons. But Mark recognized in the 80s that there was a huge market in um, commercial property. And commercial property was kind of uh, like a closed shop of an old boys club back then. And Mark decided he was going to break into it. So he hired a number of people from a lot of the old firms and set up uh, Sherry Fitzgerald Commercial. And I became a graduate with, and worked with some great people in Sherry Fitzgerald Commercial. That ultimately became Cushman and Wakefield in Ireland. They bought that business. So that's what Cushman and Wakefield is now. But Mark probably taught me all about marketing and, and being prepared for meetings. Mark would always grill you the day before you went out to meet a client. He'd meet you 24 hours before, shows your presentation, shows your pitch. And invariably, every time you pitch to him. So getting ready for a pitch on a Wednesday with a client meant being ready on the Tuesday for Mark. And Mark would bring you in over a sandwich and a coffee. And he'd always finish every, every time we do the pitch. You go, Ronan, you're clearly not ready. So you would have another 24 hours and he'd meet you the following morning. So he taught me about being ready. Um, and I picked that up in the States as well. They're very good in the States. They don't ever go to a meeting in the States without having their, their what are we trying, what's the message we're trying to get across? I don't think Irish people are great at that. I think they rely on being on the hoof. They see the best of business people very relaxed and very, and they think it's, they're making it up as they go along on the hoof. It takes, it takes weeks and days of pre uh, preparation, as you know, Gareth, from the media business to, to be that relaxed. You, you have to be, know what your customer is. So Mark was brilliant at that. He understood the customer. He, he pivoted 180 degrees with everybody he met. He always put himself in the shoes of, it didn't matter where it was the lady selling the 50,000 pound house in Inchicore to the big fund selling a hundred million portfolio. Everybody got the same level of attention to detail and they got the same level of commitment. It didn't matter every, don't bother going to meet somebody if you're not going to give them that commitment. You're, when we spoke uh, previously, again, you you, um, you refer a lot to to the states and certainly your your experience. You had an opportunity to go there in 1996, 
uh, to work in California and really draw on, on that different way of thinking uh, from a business perspective, but also, again, that, that opportunity to take risk. You might just discuss that a little bit more, Ronan. Well, I, before I start, I have a little funny story against myself because I was engaged to be married. And uh, my wife, the reason we ended up there, my wife was offered uh, a stint out there. Uh, it was actually three years we were out there. She was offered a stint with Intel in California. And she came home and she'd uh, said of this great opportunity. And, uh, and I said, uh, and I was building my career in Dublin. I was a little bit selfish about how it was all about me. And I said, well, we're not going. And uh, excuse my language. And she said, what's this wee shit? Well, if you're not going, I'm going. So I had a pretty important life decision to make about myself. So, yeah, it was uh, the shoe was putting under foot and I was packed my bags and away we went. So but it would turn out to be a fantastic time uh, for both of us. Um, and I got a job with a, a venture capital company out there in Sand Hill Road. And for anybody who wants to understand venture capital, if you're ever on holidays in California, most people go to San Francisco and they see Alcatraz and everyone. It's worth just getting in the car for the day and going down and tra- touring around Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park, Stanford University campus to understand the ecosystem, why it works there. But when I was working there, it's still the same. 50% of all the venture capital in the world, it comes out of Sand Hill Road, a road that's one and a half miles long. That's half of all. So the source of all capital for all startups and tech they, they were the founders, the venture capital companies there were the founders of Facebook, Intel, Google, you name it, everything comes out of there. So what they did uh, on the real estate side, uh, I had a company who used to fund startups and then when they got it, they would be in an incubator unit uh, in their offices in Sandy Road. And once they got big enough, I was sent off to find offices for them. So you also learned there was a company, I think we talked about Garth the other day, Netscape. And uh, most people in this call are too young to remember Netscape, but Netscape before, Nobody knew how to get on the internet unless you were a computer geek, but they invented a Windows program so that you could load it up, you click on it, you got into the internet. It was amazing, revolutionary of now you can use the internet. But Microsoft came along. Uh, I, we grew them from 20 people to 2,000 people in the space of two years. And I was happily taking all the offices for those people as they grew. Uh, but within... Um, about a year and a half of them launching, Microsoft decided to give away Internet Explorer for free with Windows. So what I learned was, and that, that killed our business model. And in fact, it ended up a huge class action case in the States and Microsoft ended up buying Netscape, but it destroyed their business. So it also, I was going along kind of half understanding what Netscape did, but it also taught me that when you're dealing with a business, you need to learn about what they do. I was kind of like, suddenly my biggest client became my smallest client and they were gone, vanished into thin air. How did that happen? So it taught me again about learn about the business of the people you're working with. Learn about the business you work in. How does it work? Who owns it? Where do they get their capital? How do they pay us? How does it all come together? I think too often we all run along in life just kind of, oh, well, it's just something. It's up there. It happens. And that was certainly a great lesson I got on the way the world works and Silicon Valley and the impact it can have for us all. So coming back to Ireland, CBRE, and and then moving into Green Reit and the fantastic sale last year. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, that period where you know you you go from a very difficult time uh, with, with the economic crash and being you know and in, in, in that that roller coaster journey begins leading up to the sale last year so i'll try and quickly run through from coming back from california i had worked with guns previously finton gun the great finton gun and his son pat and i are very have worked together for 20 odd years i came back finton passed away unfortunately prematurely at 51 years of age and pat uh, came back to from the uk to take over the business the resident, so he got the residential management team to take over the residential business and he set up a board and a kind of a, 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 a limited company structure rather than a family business, uh, with, which was great to change from a family owned business to take on and succeed with such an icon in business as his dad, Finton. And we grew CBRE from a 3 million turnover to 35 million turnover in the space of about uh, eight years. We, Ireland was changing. 
the established firms worked with all the traditional owners. We, we worked with a lot of maybe country builders who then became co- uh, developers of offices and industrial, and we worked and grew with them. And we sold that business to CBRE in 2006. Um, you go on then to the crash, a, a bit like um, my, you, you think you know what you know. And I suppose we were right in the center of some of the biggest deals. Like I sold juries in Ballsbridge, Barclay Court in Ballsbridge. And you kind of know the personalities and how they put the money together, uh, together to, to buy that site and bid against each other. But then you really don't know what the, where the capital stack is. None of us knew how much money and borrowings there was from Irish banking funding Irish real estate. Irish real estate was 97% owned by Irish owners and it was 85% funded by Irish debt. So it was just all locked into one small little overladen. There was no spread of the risk at all. The central bank didn't really have a control on it. The banks themselves, we didn't know. So I certainly once after the crash, we had to rebuild that business. Uh, we got that business going again, CBRE, and once it was kind of back up on its feet, Pat had left and joined Green in 2010, and I joined him in 2011. So I certainly taught myself that the next time around, I'd never let that happen again. You try and understand where is the source of capital in, in, in our industry. And, I, and now you've got a flip where Irish real estate is 85% owned uh, by, and that's, I'm talking about commercial real estate, is 85% owned by foreign institutional funds. And it's all 85% funded by foreign institutional funds. So if there were to be a collapse again, it's not going to hit the Irish taxpayer. It's not going to hit the Irish pocket. It's not going to hit the Irish banking system. It's, it's inter- international pension funds. Originally, it was a recovery play for private equity funds that were making a play on Ireland. Most of these follow around the World Bank and the IMF. Wherever they go in, they go in after. And then they, they moved on. And I, there's a lot of misdescription of funds here in Ireland. Oh, we want, uh, I've heard some of the members of the opposition say, we want the low, uh, we want the low return pension funds investing in here. Well, that's who it is. All of those big funds that get described as vulture stroke cuckoo, which is very disingenuous term for long-term capital invest in real estate um, right across Europe and the US. They are basically, our investors are the Boston uh, fireman or the Minnesota teacher or the Texas uh, utility worker, their pension, which goes into a collective fund, then invests in European real estate, which ends up uh, investing in Irish real estate. So we were at a time in Green, where Green had built uh, Blanchardstown Town Centre. They didn't borrow extensively. They had sold down a lot of real estate in the mid-2000s, and they, and they were well set up to uh, reinvest back into that market because they hadn't overborrowed. Uh, So we floated Green Reef PLC, the first REIT, the government brought out the REIT legislation. We went onto the stock exchange and invited basically money in uh, to a public vehicle. And we brought that money in from big investors in the US and in Europe. Uh, We bought a lot of real estate that, and and by the way, it's history, it's easy. People say, oh, well, well, there was a shooting fish in a barrel. There are articles and lots of correspondence that we can, I can go back to 2013 and people thought we were mad. Like who would invest in Ireland back then? It's very hard for people to describe. It's why we were, people thought we were off our brains. So we went in early, we bought a lot of land, a lot of derelict buildings, offices mainly, and logistics and retail. We refurbished all of those, built new buildings like the Ivy on Dawson Street there that people would know, uh, Molesworth Street, Harcourt Road, offices out in Central Park and Sandyford. And then once we had that REIT set up in 2018, we realized that the market didn't value what the job we had done because there was a difference between what the company was worth publicly and what the real estate was worth. So we just decided to sell the company and the company was bought by Henderson Park. And then the Henderson Park, which is a, a private equity firm based out of London, but with US pension investors. And they asked our, uh, myself and our, my colleagues to stay on to run that business here in Ireland. So I, I, hopefully I haven't overcomplicated, but that's yep. how we've ended up where we are. And we'd be the largest owner, second largest owner of offices in Dublin. 
but nobody really would know us. So uh, residential tends to get all the attention because it's a very emotive subject, but uh, we tend to focus on offices and industrial. We got out of retail a few years ago because of the threat of the internet on retail. And uh, so we can kind of go about our business nice and quietly because it's not, we house the likes of Google and Barclays and Facebook and in our buildings. So nobody really cares who owns those. It's, it's yeah. much more emotive when you talk about housing. Let's let's get into that for 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 a, a little while, and and we probably could set aside a, a series of webinars on property. So we'll, we'll we'll try and keep it focused on a couple of questions, and the, and the current debate, uh, as you said, which is uh, been quite emotive, uh, right? Residential, uh, and two questions for me. Um, when we spoke before, we talked about what what is needed to help the growth of cities like Dublin, and that we should be looking at uh, cities like Austin and Texas, mm -hmm. as opposed to Manchester. So you might expand on on that thinking. And then, secondly, as outside um, observers who would be looking in uh, to the the real politic of of what's happening in terms of. Uh, uh, I would say um, very, very abrupt legislation coming in that that uh, is now driving that narrative on property. How would that be viewed externally by investors? So the first question is the the Austin, Texas versus Manchester. Yeah, I come, come on to Austin, Texas, Manchester in a minute. Like the, the first of all, look, most people on this call are probably young people. They're probably all, if uh, most, have not bought their home, and I think it's an aspiration. Uh, of most Irish people, we have an emotive attachment to real estate. It's not seen, it's seen as a home and it's a pension proofer um, where you buy your home because the, the fear is after you retire, we don't have statutory protection of tenancies like the rest of Europe do. So if you retire and you don't own your home, you could be faced in 40 years time with very high rent without any security protection. So I think the two big things is one, we have a shortage of supply, and that is the, that's what's causing all of this uh, problem. Secondly, we have a shortage of social housing, so that's another big problem. Thirdly, um, we have um, a, a move away from high home ownership in Ireland, where it was 72% home ownership when I left college, down to 60% now. The European average is 45%. Now, I'm sure there's lots of people on the call are going to go, well, where are you going with this? But the reality is in a city, the closer you move to uh, full employment. Now, we were almost a full employment pre-pandemic. We've gone up to, we're going to settle at about 15%, but give it a couple of years, we'll go back to almost full employment. So if you track full employment around Europe and around US in the cities, unfortunately, it is a byproduct of it is the multiple uh, the earnings you have to have to buy the entry point house is almost the same worldwide. It's almost at about $60,000. It's, and people go, Oh my God, that is that the type of $60,000, 50,000, 55,000 euro combined to get to the entry level price. It might even be a little bit higher if you want to be in the center of Dublin, but in the greater Dublin area. And you can, and that's the same in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. It's in Austin, Texas. It's Amsterdam. It's Barcelona. Where you have full employment, growth employment, you have all those cities the same thing in common. Charlotte, Portland, uh, small cities, they're about the same size office market, full employment, big tech employers, big farm employers. And if, if, if you look at an hour down the road from, uh, an hour and a half down the road from Austin, Texas, you've got Memphis, Tennessee. So unemployment is 20% and you only have to earn $25,000 to buy the, the house. So it's just a drive down the road, but you don't have the employment. Uh, you, you have the same, you go out into the other parts of Ireland. We're talking about Dublin here. I think we have to start looking now about displacement of employment as well. Like I think I mentioned this before, there's no reason that most government departments should be in Dublin. It's crazy. It's absolutely not competing with tech salary. We need to start taking a whole look at that. But the back to the main thing, what causes your glut is the slow delivery of housing and a slow delivery of social housing. But our, our, our system was broken. If you think about it back in 2012, 13, when we set up the REIT, all I was watching on RTE was primetime camera videos with dark cello music of ghost estates. 
and houses, these will never be occupied. These will never be. So it, it's very quickly it flips, but it, it's much quicker. It's much slower to flip over the capital, the planning. Like it takes us on average, if we want to get planning permission, in theory, planning permission should be three months. That's the legislation. I can tell you on average, every planning application we have takes a year and a half in this country. So our planning system is broken and it's broken because we want everybody to have a voice. Not, I, don't want, I, want people, I want people to have housing, but it just once, once it's not near me. That's the Irish. We don't have a mehel. We don't have the older people who've got their house and they are protectionists. They don't want the young people living beside them in smaller houses and apartments. So that's the reality. So until you change that view, you can forget about talking about that the problem is not foreign funds coming in supplying the capital to build it. They, they'll, they'll provide, they're providing the money to get houses built for first-time buyers and they're providing the money to own these. It's, you need more supply. That's simple. And to need more supply, you need to change the approach to planning and the approach to third party appeals and approach to density. So that's ultimately for people on this call to be able to get more affordable housing. Uh, you need to take like a third of all uh, rental products in this country is social housing. So our social housing is delivered through private landlords owning apartments and renting them then under the HAP scheme. That those should be all of those people should be living in housing built for social housing by the government with, with in partnership with the private sector. And those, ha- those apartments should be released up for sale uh, or for renting to bring down rents and to bring down prices. So the, pri- the public sector is competing with the private sector as well. Like only the other day, there was a scheme announced out in, uh, by Fingal and Swords where they're giving away public land where the, a private developer is going to deliver one third of the units there as affordable and social housing. But if you go on social media, it's more about, oh, line in the pockets. The Eurostat lending rules do not allow the government to go and build housing anymore. Somebody needs to stand up and say that. That is what we signed up to in the EU. You can't, you can't aid housing. You can only do it through uh, joint ventures. But every time somebody tries to do a joint venture in the council, whether it be Oscar Trainer Road, Swords, it gets knocked politically by the councils uh, in their vote. So moving on to um, the, the wrapping up, we've got five or so minutes left running, and uh, as I said, we probably could talk for ages and ages. Uh, I just wanted to touch on how you view uh, life and, and, and what, what will change uh, post-pandemic, uh, that phrase. And then we have a couple of questions that'll bring Killian in on in terms of resilience and management styles. So looking, looking ahead to, to the economy opening up and, and hopefully society returning, what uh, do you think is going to change? We talked about retail before, mm. maybe mm-hmm. given your views on that. I, I worry about, I, I do worry about retail because uh, retail is the biggest employer in the world. Um, it's also the most important employer because uh, it's the first port of call for low income workers. It's the first port of call for casual labor for people working in college, getting through college or getting part time work. Uh, retail, I think, is going through a massive infrastructural change where um, pre pandemic, when we, we owned Blanchetown Town Centre and sold it in 2015, the reason we sold it was. Back then, uh, 97% of all retail sales in Ireland were in bricks and mortar, were out of a shop. Uh, the 7.5 billion a year spent in retail and 3% was uh, on the internet. We looked at California at the time was 75, 25, 75 bricks and mortar, 25. New York was nearly 50, 50. So we've now shifted post pandemic. We're now roll on six years. Uh, we're, about seven, we're about 75%. Um, bricks and mortar, and we're about 25% online. A lot of people in the call, I say they're young people, they'd be surprised. They probably think the weighting is more towards uh, internet, but it's actually will move more. And the more you move towards the internet, the less you've got that people. Uh, and it's not, it's not your cup of coffee. It's not your groceries. People always thought internet would do groceries. People still physically want to buy their groceries. Uh, they still want to get their cup of coffee. They still want to get their sandwich. You can't get that down online. It's the middle... And actually, low-cost retailing like Aldi, Little uh, Pennies will always survive. 
Um, and very high end like Louis Vuitton or Brown Thomas, they'll always survive. It's the middle. It's the it's look at the retailers that won't reopen. Uh, it's the gap. It's the lower ashy. It's the I'm, I'm picking wrong names, but mid, you know, middle brand retailing is going to be infrastructurally destroyed forever. They've all gone next to realized next. Basically, their shops are return drop and return. They start off every Monday with a negative uh, turnover. So that's going to affect. I really worry about the amount of employment that's going to get destroyed by that. Um, and I also worry about what our high streets going to look like when you reopen and half of those shops are just not going to be there. Yeah. And you, you know yourself, you walk down, it's happened already in rural Ireland. You go down the main street of every town in rural Ireland. My sister lives in Sligo, pre-pandemic, a third of the shops in Sligo were vacant. And yeah. you could all tell the same story in Ballina. Westport, let's say, is different because it's a tourist town. But take the, forget, the non-tour, forget the tourist towns. Think of the regular towns. That's coming to Dublin. That would be ready for that. It's going to shock you that when you walk down streets and a third of shops are vacant, we've got to reinvent how retail is done. I think our industry is a role to play because the rents that people can afford to pay, I think if you can go out there and do uh, retail on a turnover rent, so we own a shop, you say to a really clever retailer and say, look, we'll kit it out for you, put you in there, and we'll only charge you a percentage, let's say eight or ten percent of your turnover. So if you're having a good week, we have a good week in rent. If you're having a bad week, that will give much more innovative retailers. Instead of moving to go and go online to save cost, they'll be more inclined to maybe hire people and open that shop. When's the last time you saw a new retailer in the last 10 years in Ireland opening? Very rare. Before that, you used to all go to a shopping centre to see the new Jack Wills or the new Tommy Hilfiger. They're gone. There are Any new business that sets up now goes straight to online. Why would they dream of taking on fixed costs of an overhead and so that we've we've all got a role to play and you know i think how people and i think young people are more conscious of now who are we buying off where are we buying off and who you know let's support our local retailers yeah yeah ronan we're with uh as uh gay burn you should always say or or ivan yates when i used to work for him we're we're, we're out of, almost out of time uh so they're a couple of questions that uh, Killian and David have that uh, we might uh, throw at you as, as uh, we come to the end. Yeah. I'll throw to you, Killian. Yeah, thanks very much, Gareth. Um, thanks very much, Ronan. Uh, I know we, we, we've met a lot over the last year or two, but I learn something new off you every time we, we speak. So thanks so, so much for that. Um, just a question that came in um, about resilience, uh, and it kind of resonated with me, you know, with unemployment, you know, expected to reach whatever 10 or 11% later this year. And, you know, some of the lasting effects of long-term unemployment that are obviously going to be affecting so many people and the skill mismatches that you talked about. I'm curious to see what you think about how those people can use resilience to, to stay positive and stay focused um, the way, you know, you must have done in 2008 when the crash came and you were in CBRE or I had to deal with that. Was there a period of feeling sorry for yourself? Or, mm. I mean, how did you see the bigger picture and, and stay positive? Because people are going to have to do something similar in the next few months and years. There's a movie I love. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks, where they, they got lost out in space. Yeah. And, they, and the lads are all panicking around the dark side of the moon. And uh, everyone's shouting and roaring at each other. And Tom Hanks says, stop, stop. Work the problem, people. Work the problem. And it's a great phrase where, yeah, I feeling sorry for myself, 2008, you, you suddenly, like, you think in business, I climbed to the top of Mount Everest. I was just on the Hillary step. And suddenly I stood on a glacier and I slid all the way back down to the bottom again. And then you stand up and you go, oh, my God, I've got to start all over and do this all over again. And there's a great uh, if you ever get a chance to look at him, I think he did some YouTube videos. You ever get to see him speak is Pat Falvey. He's an Irish guy who's climbed Everest a few times. Pat does a great talk on climbing Everest. And he said, at altitude up at 27,000 feet, it takes you one and a half minutes to do every step. One step is because of the oxygen recovery. So he says, all you can focus on is one step at a time. I know it's a cliche, but if you think about climbing a mountain or anything you do, you, you've got to break stuff down if you're having a bad time think of the stuff you've got to first start to accomplish something each day right you've got to close off something you've got to break down everything 
into small little issues. If, if only it's the first thing right. Today, I've got to re-edit my CV. If I get nothing else done at the end of the day, I'm going to re-edit my CV. And, and, and tomorrow, I'm going to, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You know what? I really want to work with Gareth Hart, and the pecker is not giving me any replies. I want to work in media. So I'm going to send in, I'll tell you what, I'm going to grab his attention because he hasn't replied to me. I'm going to send him a CV. Gareth, look, I'll tell you what. I, I want so much work in media. You're, you, I want somebody like you to give me a break. Will you let me into your office for a month? And I'll just run around, be your dog's body. I'll make tea, make coffee. Please don't pay me. I'll clean up, whatever. I just want to get a smell of what it's like. And it's very hard to resist. Like we've had those where people just come at you. So try and think of something that's each day, do something at the end of the day. So that's one thing when you're trying to break down. Um, also, you try and I've, I've still do it. You're saying you learn something. I learn something every time I talk to somebody. Try and learn something. Just take, get one takeaway. I learn something when you, uh, you know, you find, and, and the la, you know, when you're meeting people, just get something to take away from it. And the last thing is meeting people. It's very easy when your things are going against you. You know, you kind of go into your shell. Just start connecting with people. You know, there has to be somebody you're in college with who's got that job in PwC. Just, will you do us a favor? Can I meet you for coffee? Don't ever feel, everybody has highs and ups and downs and you don't put on a face. Be honest with people. Share what's going on with people. You don't put, don't put up the front. The front is the worst thing. Because, if you, you know, if you had, if you go and you meet somebody, you go, geez, you know what? I actually, I heard Ernst Young are doing this or, I heard, um, you know, if you, you connect with people, tell them, geez, not get nowhere with these interviews. And if, if you talk to your peers, uh, that's the one thing if I go back, I, I'd say Gareth and myself at our age, you're, more, you're much more honest with your peers in your 50s than you are in your 20s. So if you can get to that stage much quicker, don't be trying to put up the front. Don't be trying to put up the brand. Be open and honest. And your peers are the greatest resource you'll ever find and connect with your peers. And you'll find most people, most people, I'd say, unless the disingenuous 10 or 20 percent people want to see people they know get on and help people. And most people love helping other people. It kind of actually gives them a buzz. So if you picked up somebody that was in college or in school with you and you see, <coughs> I see you're working in such and such, any chance I could meet you for coffee, I just want to get some, uh, some advice off you. And people love giving advice to other people. So if you ask for that, people go, oh, okay, that's unusual. Kidian's asking me for advice. Never thought he might need advice or she might need advice. So they're the things if you're a young person in a bind. It's yeah. harder to connect with people outside your peer group. It was very easy to connect. And I think the more honest, I think if you look back, oh, each, you, you'll probably find a big change in your life every five years you go by is, you're probably more honest and open with people the older you get. So get to that point quicker. Killian, if I, can I throw that back to you, Killian, in terms of uh, your own um, football uh, prowess and, and if there's one team or that, that resilience has been used uh, year in, year out, it's, it's with me. How, how, how do you tackle res, resilience? Well, I mean... Uh... It's totally different to well, it's, it's probably not that different in a sporting sense. Um, you know, Rona reminds me there of the, the the Bill Belichick and the Patriots. You know, their mantra is "Do your job." Every day they come in, they're greeted with the wall slogan, "Do your job." And I guess that's kind of the same message there. One thing that that, that goes through my head when I think of resilience is just you know you can't pour from an empty jug that's something that i was told years ago you need to look after yourself first and foremost um sometimes we can be trying to put out other fires and help teammates or how can the team develop and how can we beat dublin or how can we beat donegal and sometimes that collective uh, planning and thinking can can be detrimental if you forget about what you need to do yourself so one thing i try and do when when we have a setback or Injury is something that happens as board. I've had four four operations in the last few years, and every time I just try and focus back on well, what can I do myself? What can I do to help the team first and foremost? So I find when I'm when I'm playing badly and when I'm not doing my stuff, it's generally when I'm distracted by other people and I'm I'm trying to help elsewhere, and I haven't actually looked at myself and taken a bit of individual responsibility. So that's that's one way I I always deal with setbacks is hold up the mirror, be honest with yourself, as Ronan says. 
and um yeah uh, face the problem like the apollo 13 guys work yeah. the work the problem and I, I know i know david has has a question there i don't know if we have time to address but a brilliant one on generational different management styles but i'll throw it over to david cheers killian um, and just to echo Killian's comments on learning something, something new from you every day. We meet Ronan, um, and it's great to hear that your dear wife kickstarted your kickstarted your career back in the states as well. Um, but yeah, as Killian said, we have a question here on management styles, and you, you touched on it early on in the conversation. And the term you used was the lack of osmosis in a remote working world, but shifting and shifting and moving it towards you know what are your thoughts on management styles with you know the current uh young workforce you know your millennials or your gen z is the days of the autocratic manager gone or autocratic manager gone and moving towards that empathetic hand on the shoulder or you know what are what what are your views on um, management styles from your own perspective well, I can only speak from where the companies I work in that were most successful. I mentioned John McCahy, I mentioned Fintan Gunn, mentioned Mark Fitzgerald, Pat Gunn. Um, you know, Pat was my ma managing director, but five years younger than me. And yet when, I, he, when he worked originally in Gunn's under me, he was my graduate. So um, I think if, if you've ego, every good uh, organization I've worked in left the ego outside the door and that went right up to the top of the organization. So if you have an MD who has no ego and actually sets themselves up for, you know, criticism, slagging, openness, flat, humor, um, all of those things and being open, the door open, I've never closed the door in my office ever. From a bar, a private call where you have to make something confidential, the door is always open. And you encourage no matter who it is, the youngest, the youngest secretary who comes into the office is only in the, you, you, you kind of make sure you make them feel at ease. And you, once you do that, then the, you don't need to be autocratic. So when the pressure's on and you need to make that phone call, okay, folks, I need you to work all weekend. This is, we're under pressure here. It's got to be done by Monday morning, nine o'clock. There's never a problem. They, they all will go a, a million miles for you. That's what I find because they know, um, and, and also over-promising and under-deliver. I think we've touched on this before, David, is where uh, if I've gone, I, I go to somebody and say, look, one of, the, one of the guys or girls who works with us and said, look, I need this by eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, if they go, yes, um, and then they're cracking up all night trying to get this thing done and we miss the deadline. What we try and teach people is saying, look, put up your hand. If that's too unrealistic of a deadline that I'm trying to set, just say it. So you build that kind of, no, no, Ronan, get out of here. There's not a chance to get that done. And what you also, you, we've taught people in our organization, every organization worked in is you give them two choices. Here's what I can do in your deadline. Or if you want that done, here's the deadline. So it's either one or the other. So be, don't be afraid uh, to speak up and challenge. And the other thing is when you're in meetings, I always love this. If you don't understand something, Put up your hand and say, sorry, I don't understand that. Can you repeat that? And sometimes some very senior people go, oh, thank God Killian or David said that because I didn't understand it either. So don't ever be afraid to say you don't understand anything. And actually, the more you say you don't understand any, any, something, the more you, you get progress quicker. So open, uh, the best organizations are the one with open management, uh, humility, and no ego. If there's ego in the room, you're destroyed. Brilliant. It's not, it's not unlike the Alex Ferguson mantra or philosophy of, of treating every staff member as a recall from, from the cleaning staff up right up to the, to the mm. star player. So that's, that's and a brilliant you insight. One. You can't fake that, but you, you, there's certainly always been a few young egos come into our organization and very quickly they learn. Like, you know, somebody comes in with a first class honors degree and they're hired out with their masters and, you know, they, they, uh, we, we have an office manager, uh, Emily, and she's very quick to let them know where they stand in the pecking order. You know, it, it, they cut them down straight away. That goes out the window. And if that continues, they just won't land. Brilliant. Ronan, I will, uh, I'll, I'll take the reins back from, from the lads here. And, and uh, I must remember to distract Killian ahead of that Donegal match. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
But Ronan, can I thank we, we, you? We, we, we'll set up a big long seminar the night before. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but I'd like to thank you, Ronan. It was a fascinating listen and uh, just the honesty with what you've put across, uh, your views, and, and certainly I uh, have taken away some really great nuggets of, of uh, insights from you. So thanks a million for your, your time. And uh, on behalf of, of Killian and, and David, thank the the audience uh, for taking the time to join us today. And um, hopefully we get a bit of sunshine over the weekend to to enjoy the, the barbecues. Uh, so And, and, and th- thanks, Garrett. And I'd just like to point out for the anyone's on the call, um, you know, one thing about I've done a little bit of work with uh, Killian and David and you know if you're going to work with people you work with honest people and uh, it's uh, the two guys are they're great to work with it's you know you, you lo- I love working with people who are just straight up and honest about themselves they're just hard workers endeavor and good people to work with so if anybody's in the call who wants to work with them I can definitely speak I can't speak any higher about the two of them god to hear that from you is, is brilliant, Ronan. So very much appreciate it. And uh, thanks to Gareth as well for brilliantly facilitating the call. So we leave it at that. Thanks a million to everybody. Thank you, folks.